It's time for Deploy on Friday. You know what that means. Jim and John are here to share with you the latest tech trends and news that we saw throughout the week. And joining me as always is Jim Peltier from Melbourne. How are you, Jim? Good, mate. How are you doing? Well, we've been busy, eh? Lots of stuff happening yeah, this week. Lots of stuff. What have you been working on lately? Uh, we're still deep under the covers discovering things. I'll uh, I'll be able to talk more about that, I think, maybe in, in, uh, in the coming quarters. But yeah, our team's Got uh, all the all the blinds drawn, magnifying glasses out, looking deep into some of the the internals of Octopus. Please tell yeah. me there's something awesome coming. Please tell me <laughs> that it's it's going to be amazing. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. We've been we've been pretty busy actually. Lots of work going into uh, perf improvements. Lots of work going into making Octopus more scalable. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. But um, yeah, it's just amazing when you have the time to just focus on things like perf and scale and you're like, wow, we, we could fix this, we can fix that, etc. cetera. So uh, hopefully in the coming weeks and months, we'll have a lot more to share as we continue on that journey. All right, let's go ahead and get started with the latest news. So for those of you who aren't aware, we shipped a new version of Octopus 2023.1 is now available. This shipped on March 3rd and features a number of updates, uh, specifically around performance, as I mentioned earlier. One of the new things that we've added recently is we now have a Helm chart for installing Octopus into a Kubernetes cluster. So this is pretty cool. You can find this up on Docker Hub. So if you go to hub.docker.com and you search for Octopus Deploy, there you'll find our account. And in there, you'll find a Helm chart for download that you can download and use to install Octopus onto a Kubernetes cluster, which I think is pretty fantastic. Some other things that we've done, uh, making technical upgrades faster. Uh, we've made some improvements to some steps, namely the deploy Kubernetes container step. This aligns to a lot of the work that we have planned for this year for improving uh, stuff around K Kubernetes uh, going forward. So this is kind of going to kind of nicely dovetail into that work. Uh, we've also improved the deployment experience around for enterprise and cloud users for deployments themselves. Again, that's more perf improvements. And then for those folks who are using config as code, uh, that is, if you have an OCL file underpinning your deployment process, guess what? You're using config as code. Congratulations. Uh, we've added some performance improvements there. Was there any code that shipped in this release that uh, you touched, Jim? Nothing from me. Nothing from me. Okay. I'm not shipping code at the moment. But uh, oh, yeah, come on, don't you? <laughs> I have uh, seen some of the stuff that the um, the team looking at Kubernetes, uh, improving our Kubernetes story, has been doing some of the the mockups of those, and I think there's some really exciting stuff coming there as well. Yeah, if you're at all interested, you can check out our roadmap. This is at roadmap.octopus.com. This is using product board underneath the covers, and there you'll find a list of stuff that we've launched. So these are all the features, awesome. And we have stuff that's planned. So you can see when we talk about the Kubernetes stuff, um, so obviously when you do a deployment for Kubernetes, there's lots of stuff you have to stand up. Uh, there's reefs, there's pods, there's resources, ingress rules, egress rules, uh, lots of stuff that you have to specify. The, the ability to show that status during deployment, which we're calling Kubernetes object status, is on our product board list as uh, under is being planned. So uh, be aware that if you're if you're looking to do Kubernetes deployments via Octopus, uh, it's going to get super awesome. So we got lots of stuff planned there. Uh, can't can't reveal everything, of course. It's a that's what we like to call in the business a teaser. So there you go. Awesome. All right, so jumping over to other orders of business, this was an article that was written by a member of my team, Andy, who wrote about his 10 of his favorite actions for GitHub Actions. Now, there is a ton of actions in the marketplace. If you go to GitHub today, and in particular, you take a look at the marketplace, there you will find a page that looks like this. And if you select the actions type, you'll see we have almost 18,000 actions available wow. to us. So I remember when this number said 400, that was only a couple of years ago. So <laughs> it's grown, it's grown a lot. And so this, this article that Andy wrote talks a little bit about his favorite ones. So Test Reporter, this one is actually one that we use within Octopus quite a bit. So Test Reporter allows you to provide a summary of your unit tests at the end of a, of a run in GitHub Actions. So this is the, this is the action here. And uh, unfortunately it's in black, but whatever. 
Um, so you can see when you, it runs these tests, will generate for you this nice sort of summary of all the unit tests that either passed or failed. And so that's a nice way of actually articulating that. So that's the test reporter GitHub action and uh, definitely one that we like. Build and push a Docker images. I mean, come on, that's self-explanatory. You got to be able to do that, right? So the, the Docker CLI uh, is is something that, that is pretty widely used, uh, but this is using tools like BuildX and Moby BuildKit. BuildKit is very popular for, for this action. I see it in Dagger-based pipelines as well. Uh, you doing a lot of PHP development there, Jim? Not doing a lot of PHP development, but uh, <laughs> I, know, I know a lot of people out there are. I'm okay. glad this exists Fair enough. for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we, we joke, but, you know, PHP, if you need to set it up and uh, basically use it for your, your websites, you can do so. Uh, this allows you to set up your extensions, INI files, etc. Git tools, obviously very important if you're wanting to track changes, uh, utilize for Git version, release manager, all that stuff. This is an essential. If you're, if you're doing anything with deployments, if you're doing anything with change tracking, etc., Git tools absolutely must, uh, must have. Action automatic releases. This is something that uh, you can do as well with, with GitHub Actions, uh, the ability to promote and generate change logs, new releases, etc. That's obviously really important. A repository dispatch action, this one is interesting. I don't know why Andy included this one because there is a dispatch, there is a dispatch mechanism. I think that this one may be different, but I know that there's a workflow dispatch uh, action that you can specify in your GitHub Actions, an event type, and allows you to manually uh, invoke these. But uh, re repositories dispatch. I haven't heard of this one, so that's a new this one for me. This like integrate with other repositories or workflows or yeah, maybe projects maybe. or something. Maybe I'll have to take a look at this one later. Well, there you go. Something I learned. Mm. Uh, pull review. I don't know what this one is. The pull review action allows you to re review pull requests by spinning up live environments for code reviews. Look it up. Action. Oh, pull, Interesting. Pull preview. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Pull. What did I say? Pull review. Sorry. Pull, pull review, preview. Yeah, pull preview. My, my yeah. <laughs> Missing the P there. Sorry. Uh, spin environments in one click. Awesome. So yeah. So here it is. So you you create uh, create an action. It deploys to this. De this is deployment. So these are environment. These are GitHub environments. Just so folks are aware. So uh, GitHub has its own notion. So this isn't an octopus thing. This is a GitHub thing. GitHub has its own notion of environments. It's quite primitive, but it's it's it works. Uh, but they have this notion of um, deployments as well, and then you can view them there. So that's kind of cool. Uh, report generator, that one's obvious. Git version, that one's obviously similar to uh, Git tools, very important. And then the GitHub action tester. This one is is kind of cool. Um, there are solutions to do this as well uh, within, there's a tool called ACT that I've used in the past uh, that allows you to run your actions locally. Uh, this, is a, this is an action that allows you to run a shell script every time an event occurs within your repo. Again, I'm not sure if I would use an action for this, but you know, I'd probably just do, I just do an event handler inside of my action and then just run it that way. I don't think you'd need an action for that, but I guess this is a way of wrapping that up. So that makes sense. Awesome. So that's an article from Andy and you can go ahead and check that out. It's up on our blog. Another thing I wanted to mention, and Jim, I don't know if you know this, but we have a subsite on the octopus.com website. So if you go to octopus.com slash DevOps, you'll find this page. We built this page because we found that a lot of people had questions about DevOps. And this is basically our engineer's handbook. If you want to know everything that there is to know relative to DevOps, the things, the views that we have relative to DevOps, uh, the, the people process and tools, as I like to say, rather than people process before tools. But um, this talks a lot about this. And we're going to continually add to this site as we build it out. So we talk about tools, talk about principles, talk about culture, talk about working with people, talk about metrics. Of course, a lot of these things obviously play into the product of Octopus itself. So metrics are a key feature of Octopus, store metrics, etc. This is a way to discover this thing and read some of the motivation and background around these things. So if you go into, if you go into Octopus and you turn on insights, which is basically Dora metrics, you may wonder like, why, why do I need to know this? What are the benefits of doing this? This is a site to help you understand these things. So that, again, that's octopus.com slash DevOps. Interesting side note, this is actually made with Astro. So Astro is a new web framework, well, new-ish web framework, and we're really keen on it. It's a really nice framework that we've used, and uh, version 2.1 just shipped. So we've talked about this previously in Deploy on Friday, but um, we use this for the DevOps site. And so we're one of the cool kids. 
so to speak. So yeah. 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 There's these are all the cool web frameworks that all the all the cool kids talk about. So we're using Astro for this, which is awesome. Amazing. Yeah, that site's fantastic. Being ever been on the DevOps journey for you know for a while, you sort of it, it surprised me when I went back and read it and went, Oh god, there's actually a lot here. Like it's yeah. <laughs> there's a lot yeah, yeah. here. It's really yep. great stuff. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Uh, we're going to add more and more to it. And we've mm. just started our video series uh, called Inside DevOps as well. We're going to promote, obviously, our video content, our, our text content. Uh, we're going to provide, we're going to have a bunch of campaigns around this. We're going to do a lot of stuff around this to try and help folks better understand, you know, all the ins and outs and intricacies of DevOps. And so a lot of work, kudos to the team that's building this, this is Andy and Steve. And uh, everyone else on the marketing side is building this out. And we've got, obviously, um, the insights being driven by, uh, obviously, our engineering and product leaders. So we've got a lot of stuff coming in here, which is fantastic. All right. So that's pretty much a brain dump of everything that happened in the Octopus world. And let's move on to the general tech news. This is something that came across my radar. I actually had the 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 honor of interviewing the founder and creator of Ngrok, uh, Alan Shreve, earlier this morning. And Ngrok is a, if you haven't heard about Ngrok, it's a tool, it stands for um, basically Network Rock. And what Ngrok does is it allows you to basically um, basically have ingress as a service. It's, it's, a, it's a tool that's it's, it's fantastic. It basically, the way that most developers think of Ngrok today is they think of like, I fire up, I want something to expose to the outside world from my developer machine. This is typically how developers think of Ngrok. And so I'll run Ngrok on a can line and this will open up a port for me uh, in a safe and secure tunnel. Um, and then expose that to the outside world. So the the statement, it works on my machine, actually rings true because people can see it. But Ngrok is so much more than that. It's basically providing turnkey uh, integrations with things like, earlier today, Alan was telling me and showing me the ability to turn on um, OAuth integration, uh, the ability to do ingress really easy on home, so many different services. It is an immensely powerful tool. The whole reason why I mention this is because uh, recently, They've added uh, Ngrok Go, which is an ingress for your Go apps. And the reason why they do this is because, and they're doing this also for Rust and for JavaScript and for .NET, et cetera. And so the whole reason why they do this is because there's a bunch of facilities that you want to set up as ingress. So here's an example. This is basically um, the main loop here where you start your program in Go. And don't worry about the semantics of this. This is, if, if, you're, if you were to do a mental search or in place of let's provision some kind of endpoint receiver, this is what this does and then allows you to receive it using the HP infrastructure. That's all this does. But then, then this is the really powerful part. Notice here, they're just we're just wiring up configuration. So it says, I want to allow this domain, or I want to enable OAuth with GitHub. Um, you just wire those in, and it does all that management for you. So it does ingress services, allowing you to do any of this stuff uh, very, very simply through one line of code, basically. And so this is a, a framework that's available, a library that's available that allows you to do all these things and just turn on or off these facilities if you're utilizing Ngrok, Ngrok as part of your stack, which I think is fantastic. And so Ingress uh, is basically a high level abstraction. And this is the statement that Alan uh, made to me this morning, which I thought really resonate. Developers are forced to work with their network stack as, as if it's like an assembly langu level language of networking. It's like, it's too hard. I have to set this up, set that up, set up verbs, set up receivers, allow this IP address range, do this OAuth, do that OAuth, whatever. And now if you just integrate Ngrok, um, you simply just wire it up and it does it all for you magically, which is fantastic. So this is a library I'm immensely excited to get my hands on. This was announced last week and Alan gave me the, the sort of details about that, which will be on an upcoming interview of Inside DevOps. Shameless plug there. There you go. That's really interesting. I've because I've used Ngrok exactly the way you describe, right? Like, yeah, something's working on my machine. Uh, I want to hook up my mate's UI to the API running on my machine, right? Yep, yep. But this is something else. This is this is like, uh, yeah. So this this isn't your dad's Ngrok. Ngrok has no. evolved. Ngrok. Yeah. So the most the way that I think most people think of Ngrok these days is the six, seven-year-old definition of Ngrok, where it was just a, a way of piercing the firewall through a secure tunnel, et cetera. 
but it's evolved way, way past that. So now it's built-in security, turnkey observability, um, a, a huge CDN that is available for you. Yeah, right. um, so there's lots so and lots of capabilities it's there. production services now as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. and it's also a ingress controller for Kubernetes as well. So there's lots and lots of stuff in here. And so Looks basically, this is the way this clarity. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the way they start They say, take it from development. This is this is the, the typical scenario that people think of. You, you fire up Ngrok, you want to expose your local directory via yeah. port 3000, and then you can configure it. They also have a Terraform provider. So that was cool. I didn't realize they had a Terraform provider as mm -hmm. well. So so they they basically have evolved the platform in a huge way. And now it is at a point where it is getting really, really awesome. And so I was really keen to talk to Alan, Alan, excuse me. And uh, we had a great conversation this morning. So again, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You will find our interview there, hopefully in the future. So uh, yeah, another shameless plug. I'm okay with that. <laughs> so um, I am a huge fan of slash commands. I know you are too, Jim. Slash commands are very popular in platforms like Twitch and in Slack and Teams and Discord and Mattermost and blah, 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 blah. So basically, the idea is I can take a slash command and, and replicate some behavior very quickly rather than clicking, clicking, clicking. And so what GitHub has added is support for markdown helpers via slash commands. So typically, you know, I, I don't know about you, Jim, but I, I do a lot of GitHub flavored markdown. So I'll create like tables and things like that. And uh, I want to basically articulate it quickly and it can be a bit tricky. So now uh, these are markdown helpers powered by slash commands within GitHub, which I think is pretty nice. Yeah, totally. So the idea here is I can I can simply type slash on any issue, pull request, discussion, uh, and then use the subsequent dialogue. It's kind of like, you know, some people have mentioned, like, it's kind of like IntelliSense or it's autocomplete or some. Yes, yeah, to a certain extent, there are some commands uh, to make markdown tables or slash details to make selectively showing content to readers much easier rather than rather than remembering the detailed uh, HTML formatting. So, well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, I do I do some of this, but I tend to sort of like um forget what all of the syntax is so yeah, my, my yeah, ability yeah. to do it is limited by my ability to remember all the syntax <laughs> so this is a really great yeah yeah so typically typically something you might you might write something like uh for a code block you might go back tick back tick back tick and then you can you can't remember the language and how it's written like it's c sharp mm -hmm. but do i write c dash word sharp or mm -hmm. do i write c uh, hash symbol or, you know, that sort of thing. So there's lots of different, so this code, these, these different slash commands simplify that. So code block details, saved replies, uh, which I think is going to be good because it's kind of like making it like email, I guess, uh, table, the canonical one templates. I don't know what that one is easily populate your repositories issue or pull request templates directly from slash commands. Ah, interesting. So if you're using a repository issue template or pull request template, you can just go slash template and then use that one there if you don't have it auto wired up. That is nice. Task list, yes, task list. Those are always a bane. Square brackets are really hard to type. I don't hate. I hate typing them because I always screw up. I get the curly brace instead. Um, but yeah, so that's cool. That's cool. I like that. I like little little refinements like this are perfect. I like that. It makes makes my developer heart happy. So that's awesome. So that's now available in beta. This is Jim. Have have I told you about Dagger? Have I told you about the wonderfulness of Dagger? Do you know anything about this? A lot of people have told me about the wonderfulness of Dagger, but I have not had the pleasure yet. All right, let gather round, children. I'm going to tell you a story. All right, so Dagger, which is at Dagger.io, if you want to if you want to check it out, Dagger's been on my radar for quite a while, uh, and the reason for this is because, as you probably are aware, wiring up pipelines isn't the easiest thing to do. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you set up your GitHub repo, you know, you get your code structure going, you start doing check-ins, et cetera, et cetera, or sorry, pull requests, you start structuring your issues, yada, yada, yada. Then you want to start structuring your workflows, right? So what do I do for a build? What do I do for this? And then I have to start cooking up YAML and then it gets revolting. And then my, and then I have to get a ruler out because none of my indentation is aligned or whatever. And then my company decides, hey, we're going to stop using GitHub. We're going to use, I don't know, JetBrains, or we're going to use GitLab or whatever. And all of those workflows that I've constructed may not port over easily. So the idea with Dagger, and this is from the company that built Docker, is that rather than worrying about the implementation details of where things run. So the idea is that rather than worrying about that, your pipelines are now portable. So what they do is, is I'll show you the diagram here that kind of mails at home. So Dagger Engine sits on top of the Docker 
uh, sits on any Docker runtime that's compatible. So, you know, a component, uh, a container runtime. And then that allows those pipelines to be port, which means you can run them anywhere. So I can take my pipeline and switch CI systems, for example, and have that run with me. In addition mm -hmm. to that, they're utilizing languages, which I think a lot more people want than, say, YAML. The tough thing with YAML is that when it fails, it really sucks. And so a lot of developers want to define their, their workflows in code. And so it's a combination of portable workflows, or pipelines rather, with code if necessary, if you wish. So that that is really nice, I think. So Dagger is is that is the story behind Dagger. Now, coming back to why I mentioned this earlier is Dagger 0.4 shipped earlier today, adding support for service containers, uh, secret scrubbing, and more. And so this is an article that goes into uh, what are the latest features in 0.4. So service containers have been one of the most requested features. They are now finally available. This feature enables you to run network services like database or web apps as ephemeral containers directly inside a Dagger pipeline. So again, remember, these are portable pipelines. And so you can take them anywhere that Dagger can run. And this can run in GitHub. This can run local. Um, so you can take your local pipeline, push it over to GitHub, bing, bang, boom, done. So it's really nice there. Uh, secret scrubbing, Dagger now automatically scrubs secrets from its various logs and output streams, very similar to how GitHub works today. So if it sees a secret, it will asterisk it out. And so I guess now you don't see, yeah, so you see the same output now as part of Dagger's run. So there you go, 0 0.4 of Dagger. That's, uh, that sounds very enticing. One of the, <laughs> one of the, one of the biggest pain points for me always with, because I mean, you want to create your, your pipelines as code, of course, so you can mm. evolve them and mm. put your source of truth and all that sort of thing. But that means you need to check them in before they can run. And that yeah. means when you get that YAML wrong, you've got to wait no for it to check in, no one can wait hear you for scream. it to build. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. So if I can do that locally, get it right, imagine checking in a pipeline that works first time correctly and not having that, uh, the WTF, the maybe this time, did that fix it commit log? Yeah. <laughs> So you can you can pick your poison. So it says choose your SDK. So you can you can they have a variety of SDKs you can write your pipelines in. Yeah. And in addition to that, there are extensibility mechanisms inside of the SDK uh, itself. So you can add uh, parts and pieces to it if you wish. Uh, it is early days, so don't think that this is something you can just pick up and run with right now and have it fully featured and compete with everything. But the promise of this is very nice. Um, I think Dagger is going to give a lot of other uh, runtime, rather workflow engines a run for its money. And if uh, just last thing I'll say, if GitHub supported this, they wouldn't need the, they wouldn't have the need for system or tools like act, which allows you to run mm. GitHub actions locally, right? It would just mm. work. So I'm I'm quite bullish on this idea. Yep. TypeScript. When was the last time you cooked out some TypeScript? It was for me, it was like a month ago, I think I've been I've been yeah. doing too much go code recently. Yeah, no, TypeScript TypeScript's pretty day to day for me. We've yeah, a lot of uh, that, that's end, fair. So, yeah. That's fair. Yeah, unless yeah. you're, unless you're one of our front end engineers, which in which in which case they're living and breathing it every day. I, I'm sure yeah. the folks watching this on our team <laughs> who are doing the front end dev, they're like, yes, TypeScript five. So TypeScript five is now available. So there you go. Uh, I'm sure you're ecstatic about this, right? I am. I am. <laughs> I love TypeScript. I know. I really do. I think TypeScript's an amazing language. The the type yeah. the type system and the features is just really groundbreaking. I think. So TypeScript, uh, well, it's necessity, right? I mean, this mm. is why we have it. So um, the 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 list of new features are listed in the doc. They've made it right at the top, the uh, the bottom line up front sort of approach. So decorators was the big one. Uh, I think we talked about this in a previous episode of Deploy on Friday. We talked about yeah. const type parameters. We talked about yeah. enums as union enums. Um, so lots of features there. A variety of compile time switch uh, flags now that you can use. Uh, overload, overload satisfies support for JS doc, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots and lots of stuff uh, that's available in TypeScript 5. The reality is, is that TypeScript 5, the, the preview and the betas and all this have been around for a bit. So folks have been experimenting with this. Uh, I don't know if there's a huge list of breaking changes. I actually haven't seen the list of breaking changes yet, but I would imagine this is more of an evolutionary uh, update as opposed to a massive breaking change update. Oh, excuse me, breaking changes. Sure, Here we go. Right there. Yeah. yeah, sorry. API breaking changes. Okay, so there are some, there are some, yeah, enums would get completely redone. This yeah. could be, this could be a problem. <laughs> 
excuse me, I'll take back what I just said. It, it is the it is the same sort of mechanisms, right? Like I think yeah. quickly scanning this, what it's saying is things are going to now correctly give you an error where they weren't going to yeah. give you an error before. Now that's going to be really difficult for people if they've um, you know not realized that this error was going to crop up and all of a sudden there's errors all over their code base. But usually they're pretty good at providing escape hatches for this kind of thing as right. well. Types of, like there's usually a compiler flag or you know the TS config you can set it or you can go around and ignore them or something like that. I'm guessing this is going to be a compile time error. Yeah. Not a runtime yeah. error. Yeah. Okay. What else? Oh, deprecations. Lovely. <laughs> Finally, ES3. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. All right. So there you go. TypeScript 5. Um, yeah. If you're using TypeScript, definitely go check it out. If you're at all curious, you can use the TypeScript nightlies. Uh, there's a extension. Um, so you can grab it via NPM. You can also get it via uh, VS Code. So the nightlies you can grab and integrate directly that way if you're so inclined. So definitely worth checking out. Um, we have some other things where I'm just out of order here. So the next thing I wanted to mention is uh, Vault. Uh, HashiCorp Vault has updated and shipped a couple of sets of new climate libraries for Go and .NET. These are now available as a public beta. So you might wonder, what is Vault? <laughs> so uh, you have to make sure that you know people are, are aware of what we're talking about here. So Vault is a product from, from HashiCorp and allows you to basically secure all basically values that you want to protect within applications and services. It's providing a centralized mechanism for storing these things and then reading them safely and sanely in and out and being able to uh, have permissions around access, et cetera, et cetera. So what that means is now you can integrate Vault within your Go and .NET applications via their client libraries that they've made available. And this is now available through HashiCorp as a public beta. What was interesting about this blog post, they talked about how they did this using Open API for CodeGen. So I thought right. that was cool. So yeah. they're using CodeGen quite a bit for this. Definitely going to make their life easier when it comes to maintaining it. Yeah. So here's the getting started for, for .NET. Establish a Vault configuration, set up a token, and then read and write, or read, I guess. Yeah. So there you go. Awesome. That's nice. the new client libraries for Go and .NET for Vault, public beta. This is a tweet from Matt Rickard, who is a former engineer, I believe, at Google. Let's take a look at his profile here. He was formerly at Google, uh, working at Kubernetes, uh, and now I'm assuming is probably at Blackstone. Anyways, he wrote this tweet, which I thought was interesting. Um, he summarized it in an article called An Ideal CI CD System, where he talked about what would be the ideal CI CD setup or system that if he had to envision the stack, um, it would be serverless. So it'd be ephemeral and serverless. That makes sense, right? You don't really want things hanging around. There's no reason to be managing Jenkins or individual yeah, nodes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. Um, on prem or cloud prem uh, for small projects, fine to use hosted CI CD services, but anything bigger than a toy project probably should be spinning up runners inside your cloud account. That makes sense. Minimal permissions. Um, or native uh, IAM, um, if you're a WS, uh, AWS person, IAMs are very, very prevalent, obviously, but those are basically your, your user uh, context. So workers should authenticate in a cloud native way, uh, OIDC, and be deployed with a minimal set of permissions. That makes sense to me. You want to minimize the amount of exposure. Easy to debug. Oh, hallelujah. Like, you know, mm. being able to debug these things, as, as you and I rightly just pointed out, when YAML yeah. goes wrong, uh, it goes really wrong. Triggers, but not complicated ones. So he talks about calls up GitHub Actions. Provides a good model for running workflows ma automatically, uh, but don't build a complicated business process around for manual triggers. And I would agree with this. I really like GitHub Actions event model. I don't know about you, but I think their event model is pretty solid. What do you think? Uh, I have spent a bunch of time trying to get them to work in Act and not... Oh, okay. Well, there success, you go. So... <laughs> <laughs> I, I can understand where uh, Matt's coming from here. Okay. Code, not YAML. We just talked about, we literally just talked about this with Dagger. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, DAG, I'm not sure 
plagiarism. Directed acyclographically. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that might be true. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 So I, so a few of us commented in here. I was one of them. Um, so we had comments from a variety of people. A lot of people mentioned Dagger, uh, which yeah. I thought was funny. So uh, Keith Pitt, who is the founder and CEO of um, BuildKite, a uh, very popular CI tool. Uh, said, hey, we support this in BuildKite. And of course, I had to dogpile on that and say, oh, one ad, you could add Octopus Deploy to the mix. And uh, you could also consider Dagger if you want portable pipelines. So uh, you can see in here, people are mentioning BuildJet. Have you heard of BuildJet? No. These, these guys were part of Wide Combinator recently. Yeah. And what they do is they give you faster um, runs of, of your GitHub Actions. So they provide mm. super powerful runners for GitHub Actions. And they talk about make your make your builds like two times faster and cheaper. So just by one line of code changing here from a built-in runner, which is the one provided by GitHub, if you replace it with the one from BuildJet, it goes off the BuildJet, but then it runs it really, really fast there. And it, it gives some comparisons of how fast their runs could be. And these are the wow. prices they offer. And look at this monster, 32, <laughs> 32 virtual CPU, 64 gigs of RAM, and uh, four cents a minute, approximately. Yeah. So. Awesome. Uh, so that's BillJet. So BillJet is one that was mentioned in that ideal stack. So you can just view through here, like uh, what people are thinking. I think a lot of people are are, are hoping for something like Docker. Um, sorry, like Dagger. Excuse me, I'm getting my terms mixed up. Yeah. yeah. So people are mentioning Dagger in here as a code uh, only or code first approach, maybe for defining yeah. pipelines. People are mentioning GitLab. You know, I had to, of course, mention Octopus. So there you go. So I thought this was an I think this was an inter I think this is an interesting discussion. Like what makes an ideal system for you in your mind, Jim? Like is it is it this list? Does this fall is there anything missing in this list from your perspective? Uh, the only thing that I would see is like manageability or or observability. Like being able to to get alerted. I think some some of the stuff you have to roll yourself. Like if a build breaks or a deployment fails, you know, obviously with Octopus, we have integrations and stuff. But if those things happen, those out of the box solutions tend not to exist. I don't know about you, but I would like yeah. to be notified on Slack, like, hey, something broke or, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like you have to wire that all up yourself. It's really frustrating. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a few different, there are a few different things you really want out of a CI CD system at different stages of evolution of something. Like when you're doing something new and modern, and you've got control over everything, that fast feedback that something like Dagger would give you when setting up your pipeline is the most important thing, right? Because you want to evolve it and modify it. Then it, as it, as the the solution probably evolves, it gets bigger and now you've got more tests and the tests are more complicated and they start failing. So you need, um, you know, insights and observability, like you said, over, over what's going wrong as the solution gets more complicated. Um, or you go a different route and maybe things get smaller and start having to interact with each other, which is again, right. probably more of the um, the triggers and, and all of that sort of integration that he's talking about here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people jumped on this one and it's oh, unfortunate. No, this is, this isn't, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of upset. You didn't make this number one. I don't think anyone likes YAML and I think the people who say they do are lying. I don't think anyone likes YAML. And I think yeah. that, I think if 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 it was easy, if the object model was easy enough to use, or the API was the object uh, the API was easy enough to use, people would gravitate towards code in no time flat. And I think YAML is fine to a, to a certain extent, but for for complicated pipelines, and you and I have built our fair share, this YAML falls apart really fast. And yeah. it, like I've seen YAML documents that make your eyes bleed. And they're so big and they're so convoluted. And you're like, I don't know where I am. And you need to break out the ruler and all those jokes that there's a reason why those jokes exist is because it's yeah. really hard. And Yaml really so falls I, into that demoware trap, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. Like, look how simple this this uh, hello world application is in Yaml. Yeah. And then yeah. Yeah. that we don't build I that agree. very often. Yeah. yeah. And I think I think Yaml is very much like a uh, the opposite code is very much like do as I say, not what I mean. And YAML is the opposite. YAML is do what I mean, not what I say. And mm -hmm. yeah, because YAML is a very high level sort of representation. And I don't think it maps well for pipelines. I think, I think despite the fact that everyone supports it, I don't <laughs> know if what the future of YAML is holds long term, long term. Um, well, it doesn't around look like it. I mean, the, the trend's definitely towards code, right? All the newer yeah. generation of tools are supporting code first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm yeah. with you. I'm with you. All right. So an ideal CIC system 
go check it out if you're at all curious. So that's up on Twitter there. And that's from Matt yeah. Rickard. Thanks, Matt. That's a great, great comment. And uh, definitely felt like good thread. That was one I want to jump in on. Yeah, like it. <sighs> Wouldn't be a day without another announcement from Microsoft. God, what, like what is with Microsoft and GitHub? Like they're constantly just hammering us with updates, right? So .NET 8, Preview 2. Barely had enough time to absorb Preview 1. Now we got Preview 2. It's like, now it's shipped. It's like, what? Are they, are they shipping every Friday? Maybe they're, yes. they're taking the, the show name to heart too much. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I, yeah, they, they, it's exactly right, Jim. We've influenced them. <laughs> We've said, look, deploying on Friday is the way to go. And uh, .NET 8, let's deploy on Friday. No. Uh, so .NET 8 Preview 2, giving kind of like showing their hand of what they're thinking about. Early feedback is what they're aiming for here. So uh, this is a monster uh, amount of stuff that's coming, obviously. So... Data annotations is a big one. So this is allowing to specify things like lengths and no default values. These are attributes you can specify on various types. So I want to have uh, values inside of this I collection interface uh, between, or, or sorry, I want at least 10 elements, uh, but no more than 20 elements. Uh, for example, uh, I can specify ranges. So these are all data annotations. It's a new part of uh, .NET, the library. Uh, System.reflection, introspection support for function pointers. That's cool. I don't know. Do I want? Do I want to know when I would use I'm, this? I'm wondering the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. We'll oh, just wow, skip that then. That. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> just skip. I don't know. I'll figure it out later. Yeah, um, yeah. But in, in addition to that, there's uh, updates coming for ASP.NET Core, EF Core, et cetera, et cetera. So if you take a look at what's coming in ASP.NET Core, in .NET 8 Preview 2, new Quick Grid component. Got to have a Quick Grid. I mean, you can't have a .NET release without a Quick Grid. Uh, improve, Im improved WASM performance. Um, this word I haven't been able to 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 say yet. Is it is it JIT interpreter in your head, or is it JITerpreter? I think it's JITerpreter. Yeah, I, I stumbled over this earlier. This one, I can like, yeah. is it? Did they did they typo this? And it's not. <laughs> it's that's what it's called. It's called the JITerpreter, yeah. and it sounds like someone screwed up, or it's like maybe it's a word I don't understand. Like. Jeterpreter. It doesn't sound like proper English, right? <laughs> Sounds like the Swedish chef or something, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Jeterpreter, bork, bork. So yeah, yeah anyways. Exactly. So I don't know what this was. Anyway, so the Jeterpreter. Um, oh, on that note, just just so you know, the Jeterpreter makes... Sorry, I can't believe I'm saying this. Um, so they give you a, they give two examples here. They give a low-level operation example. So things like reverse the order of a span or normalize a string get some perf wins there 40 percent, yada yada this one's more real world json serialization so you can see they get a 50 percent, roughly 40 percent improvement on json serialization with the jeterpreter so <laughs> there you go this will be my word of the week jeterpreter mm. uh so lots and lots of features here in asp.net uh core for dotnet 8 preview 2 so make sure to keep track of what's going on there and of course Preview 2 of Visual Studio 2022 17.6. So uh, another another update here. If you're a game developer, mobile developer, or interested in learning new tricks on how to debug your code, this is uh, going to be for you for the latest release. So leveling up your productivity. So stage support, commit support during build, improve merge dialog, blah, 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 blah. Streamline game development. Totally going to skip that. I am not a game developer. You're not a game developer. Let's not admit. Let's not pretend we're game developers. .NET Mobile development, I'm going to skip that too, and enterprise management. So if we take a look at productivity, I know you're a writer guy, but I will try to convince you to jump to VS at some point. So <laughs> get stage and commit during build, improve merge dialogue. I don't see how, but whatever. Uh, breakpoint groups. I love breakpoints. I love the debugger in VS. I think it is one of the best debugger experiences. In telecode, yes, please. I love, love, love the, the debug experience in VS. It is fantastic. Instrumentation profiling for C++. We don't do C++. So profiler, live graph for .NET and on Windows uh, subsystem for Linux. What are we doing here? Okay, I guess so. Profiler support, create C++ member function. Skip, skip, skip. So if you're not a game developer, <laughs> you're not going to care. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I thought I'd mention it. Definitely worth mentioning. So, And then last but certainly not least, uh, this is... Probably one of the longest blog posts I've seen by Stephen Taub in a while. So Stephen Taub is the performance wonk at Microsoft. He's been at this since the beginning. If there's been a performance blog written, chances are he's he's either written it himself or he's had a he's had a comment or two to say about it. 
And he's talked in this article about how async await really works in C Sharp. Now, to give you a sense of just 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 think about how big this article is when you take a look at see the scroll bar over here. See how yeah, small it is. That. <laughs> this Kinda is like okay. Let's let's just page down, 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 page down. I'll just keep going. I'll just hold it. That is a monster <laughs> article. And wow. there's half for comments. So, Stephen, thank you. Uh, I've heard you're good doing, things about it though from those who have yeah, read yeah. it. Yeah. You're doing you're doing God's you're doing God's work here, basically, um, to describe to us mere mortals how async await really works in C sharp. Uh, I think the, the point of his article, which I thought was good at the end, I'll read it to you here. If you want to know anything about this article, he just basically says, I hope this post has helped illuminate, illuminate exactly what's going on under the covers. But thankfully, you generally don't need to know or care. <laughs> so basically, he gets to the end of the article and says, eh, you don't really need to know it. It's fine. But it's fine. Like, if you want to know what the IL is doing, if you want to know what's happening under the covers, if you want to see what the compiler is doing, go for it. There you go. So... Everything else is uh, everything else details, or as he calls it, optimization gravy. So, definitely an article. Uh, if you're having trouble sleeping, if you're looking to <laughs> kill uh, time on a flight, I suggest if you're looking to destroy a bunch of trees uh, or fill up your Kindle, this is the article for you. Uh, this is nice. the article worth printing out. All right. Well, that does about it for us for another edition of Deploy on Friday. Jim, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, thanks, man. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, cheers. And we'll see you next week on Deploy on Friday.